Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, April the 17th, 2021. It is currently 1017 a.m. Central Time, and I am here back at Victory Baptist Church. I'm inside of the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church, and of course, as you know, the church is located in the middle of nowhere, Texas. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. No, I did not play our professional intro. I keep forgetting to hit play on the professional intro. So I apologize. Should I should I play the professional intro? Should I should I should I do it? Should 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 I should I Looking at our world from a theological perspective. This is the Theology Central podcast, making theology central. Yes, I keep forgetting that. I apologize. Some of you say keep it, some of you say you don't care. So maybe sometimes it will be there, maybe sometimes it will not be there. You'll just have to listen every time to see if it's there. Like, I know you really don't care one way or the other, but there you have it. There's our professional intro. So welcome. That's the official welcome to the Theology Central podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, if you're listening live via the Spreaker app, hit the little chat icon Say hello, say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, I do greatly appreciate it. And I think we have hopefully something very interesting for you today. Now, this is a situation where I have handed control over to a listener. Yes, I I, I don't know where this is going to go. I am trusting that the listener has has made a a great suggestion. I'm hoping because I I don't know. You'll you'll see why in a minute. Obviously, this is our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We have been now looking at the Sermon on the Mount for a very long time. At times, this series has been extremely, I think, beneficial. At times, it's been very frustrating and irritating. I don't know for you, but for me. Now, as we've come to the Sermon on the Mount, let's just get a couple of things out of the way, these kind of foundational principles so that you kind of know where we've been and where we're going. Sermon on the Mount obviously is a very well-known section of scripture. It goes from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. This is a sermon that Jesus preached. One of the reasons we're looking at it is so many times people take verses from the sermon and they don't interpret them as being a part of an entire sermon. They just kind of grab them and just use them however they want, which is problematic. So I thought maybe looking at the entire Sermon on the Mount would be beneficial. Another reason we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount is there are lots of different approaches in how to interpret the Sermon on the Mount. The most common one within the evangelical world is pretty straightforward. The ser- that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is giving, in a sense, kingdom ethics, the, the, the morality and the ethics that those who are part of the kingdom should follow. And he does this in order to test people's repentance, because the only way you can be a part of the kingdom is by repenting. However, there is a test to see if that repentance was genuine. Just because you say you repented doesn't mean that you really did. So how do you know if your repentance was genuine? How do you know if you're really part of the spiritual kingdom of God? How do you know you'll be a part of the future kingdom of God? How do you know if you're truly saved? Well, you go to the Sermon on the Mount, you read it, and you you see that it's giving you a test. If you pass the test, your repentance is genuine, you're, you're a Christian. If you fail the test, then your repentance is not genuine, and you're unregenerate, and you're going to go to hell. Now, how do you judge this test? Well, you judge it by the level of obedience that you give to the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you give an, now we, we have yet to be told exactly how much obedience is required and how little obedience it can, can, can occur before you're, you're, you're not saved. No one really has explained that to us, but we've been told that it's a test. And we've basically been told not only is it a test, that because of the power of the Holy Spirit, you can keep it, you can do it, you can obey it. And then at the very same time in the very same sermon, they will say, but, 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 but you won't do it perfectly. So it's a test that I'll never get an A on, but I don't, it doesn't require an A to pass the test in order to get to heaven. But they haven't really told us exactly how much obedience is required. It's a very strange approach to the Sermon on the Mount, but it dominates the evangelical world. So we have challenged that perspective. We've asked all kinds of questions. I've offered a different perspective to it, and hopefully that has been beneficial. 
um, in our last couple of sessions together for the Sermon on the Mount, we've really looked at this idea of lust and what the supposed solution is to that problem. And once again, we found ourselves in all kinds of confusion. I won't go back and repeat all of that. Now, I say all of that to kind of get us to where we are today, because where we are today is I'm handing the controls over to a listener. Here's what happened. On April the 16th, at 3.12 p.m. in the afternoon, I received the following email. Hello, Pastor Hammock. I listened to your Sermon on the Mount series with great appreciation. Oh, wow. Now, that was encouraging because the Sermon on the Mount series I thought was going to spark all kinds of conversation, all kinds of back and forth. And really, most people have been relatively silent. There have been a few listeners who are very invested in the series, while the others, they may be listening, but they haven't really said much. So I'm, I'm glad to know that someone is, is at least listening to it and they appreciate what I've been trying to do. Then they state this. I want to recommend to you the sermon, a sermon and Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, by, and I'm not going to give the name of the individual. The reason I'm not going to give the name of the individual is because if I have any disagreement here, any criticism of it, I don't want it to be something like I'm attacking a person. Uh, the sermons that we've been using from the church in Council Bluffs, Iowa, I've not given you the name of that church and the name of the pastor because I, because uh, when, when you make it personal, then, then, then everyone, it becomes about, well, oh, so you hate them and they hate you. No, it, this is about, here's this section of scripture that's of utmost importance. Everyone approaches it differently. We're going to listen to how other people approach it and then use that for our discussion to to really talk about the ideas, the hermeneutics, not the personalities or the people behind it. All right. So uh, so I'm not going to give the name, but um, so it's a sermon. Now, when I looked it up, it's called Justification and Judgment is the name of the sermon. Justification and Judgment, and it's based off Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Now, and then he tell he he gives away some of the some of the content of the sermon of uh, how that in this sermon how this pastor approaches a, a certain section in Matthew 7. I'm not going to give that away right now because if I give that away, there'd be no point for you to listen, right? So that that would not make any sense. So you're going to have to listen to find out where this sermon is going to go. Now, here's a couple of things. The, the reason I'm saying I'm handing this over to the listener is you know what happens here. I don't li- like they sent me this link to this sermon. I downloaded it. I've now have it uploaded here into my software. I have not listened to it yet. So I, and the reason I don't listen to it in advance is because if I listen to it in advance, I feel like I'm rehearsing my responses and then it's not real. It's not organic. It just seems it seems fake. I don't want that. I want, I, when I listen to it, I want to listen to it in real time with you. I like to create the, the feeling that it's like you were driving past the church. You saw the car, you pulled into the parking lot, you walked in and said, what are you getting ready to do? Well, I'm getting ready to listen to a sermon on Matthew chapter seven. Oh, do you care if I join you? By all means, sit down, grab a notebook. Let's, let's sit there. And then we would listen and then I would pause it and we would discuss it. That's what I try to do here. I don't try in any of the sermon reviews we do. I don't listen to them in advance. Now, th- that is, I think it's really cool that I do it that way. Sometimes I regret that I do it that way because sometimes we get into the middle of it and I'm kind of like, uh, what do I do with this? I don't even know what to say because sometimes there's just really not much there. So I'm trusting that this listener has sent us a great sermon that's going to lead to lots of interesting conversations. Again, you're free to participate by jumping on the Spreaker app, while I'm live on the air, obviously, hitting the little chat icon and feel free to share your thoughts and opinions as we work through this sermon. Are you ready? I do not know where uh, this pastor is preaching from. I don't know the city, the state, but we're going to look at this. I want to thank the listener for sending this. Thank you so very much. Um, And well, we'll see. We will see where this is going to go. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter seven. If you have a notebook, have that ready to go. Remember, we can only write in pencil. There's no using pens. All right. Pens are a tool of the Antichrist. 
right? We only use pencils. Why do we use pencils? Because we're fallible. So whatever truth we write down today, we probably will have to erase it tomorrow and rewrite it, okay? So that's why we use pencils. And just because pencils are far superior than pens. It's just, it's a, it's an absolute fact. It's, it's scientifically proven. And because I say it, it is true. All right, so pencil, pencil, I see you. I, no, put that pen down. Come on, come on now. What are you doing? Pencil, notebook, Bible, something to drink, and let's jump in. I look forward to hearing from you during this. Let's go. All right, are you ready? Justification and judgment. I love the title because if you listen to our series on the book of Romans, we're still in Romans, we spent, it feels like a year trying to figure out how do we understand justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. At the same time, the Bible constantly says we're judged according to our works. How do, how do you reconcile that? We spent a long time trying to work on that. Um, and I think we came to a decent conclusion. Uh, but you know what? What did I just say? Whatever we wrote down in our notebook a year ago, we may have to erase it today and come up with a different conclusion because we're fallible. We're not infallible. We're always learning and we're always growing and we always have to be willing to admit past errors. So here we go. Good morning. If you will turn in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 7, and let us stand for the reading of God's word. I will begin reading at verse 13, Matthew 7, beginning at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Please. What what a powerful section of Scripture, and to me, what a frightening section of Scripture. Um, I, I find it so interesting that so many within the church We hear this passage read, we hear it preached, and we never, it's like nobody's ever concerned with it. No one's ever bothered by it. Nobody's ever fearful. Um, This passage should scare all of us to death, especially depending on the hermeneutical approach you take to it. I mean, this is a a serious section of scripture. I'm just going to go back and read through it again and just throw out a couple of thoughts here. Matthew 7, and again, how do we approach, how do we approach this, uh, this whole sermon Matthew chapter 7 here. Okay, my my Bible, the pages were getting all uh, messed up. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We got to make sure we enter in the straight gate, because if we don't enter in the straight gate, the other, the other way is going to end up in destruction, and only a few people find it. Now, only a few people find it, but everyone sitting in church thinks that they're the ones who found it. They're they're, they're the ones who entered into the straight gate. No one ever stops to go, well, I wonder if I'm, did I really enter in the straight gate? What does it mean to enter into the straight gate? How do I understand that? Some will say, well, I entered the straight gate by believing in Jesus Christ because I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Okay, I understand that. And then, now, I think, I think, I believe verse 15 is so critical here. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening, ravening wolves. 
You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Now, to me, the context there is screams that this is judging false prophets by their fruits. Now, this has been taken to apply to everyone that, hey, how do you know if you're a Christian? Look at their fruits. Hey, I'm, you know, and Christians will use this kind of like cliche kind of foolish language, but it's used, you know, hey, I'm not judging you. I'm just a fruit inspector. I'm just inspecting your fruit. And if your fruit's not good, then you're, then you're not saved. Well, okay, well then how much fruit do I have to have? What kind of fruit? How do I judge that fruit? How do I understand it? And if I'm not saved by the imputed righteousness of Christ, I'm in, I'm in, I'm saved by the fruits which are produced in my life. Then are you saying that I, that Christ infused a righteousness in me and I cooperate with that righteousness to produce enough fruit in order to be, to, to, to demonstrate that I'm saved or to prove that I'm saved? Well, now you're, you're sliding, you're sliding right back into Roman Catholicism with an infused righteousness versus an imputed righteousness. These are, these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. But I think here that the, the focus here is how do you know a false prophet? How do you know a false prophet? By their fruit. Every good, uh, every, uh, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Okay, now we would ask yourself, we're dealing with false prophets. What, what's the fruit here? Is the fruit the, their manner of living, their life, their holiness, or is this fruit their teaching? False prophets teach, and either it's good fruit or bad fruit. Is that a possibility? I'm just throwing out, I'm just throwing out some thoughts. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth uh, evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Who's the them? The them, to me, goes back to verse 15, the false prophets. This seems to be judging false prophets. And then it goes to uh, a very powerful uh, section here, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Now, depending on how you read that, you're like, okay, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, gets, gets into heaven, only those who do the will of the Father. So are you saying only those who obey God? Well, how much do you have to obey God? Because everyone will come along and say, well, you're not going to obey God perfectly. Well, then how much obedience is required? Right? And then it goes to to say that they, they say they did all of these things. Now, look again. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, is that a reference to maybe false prophets who are walking around doing all of these things in the name of Jesus, yet they are false teachers? Do we apply it there? Do we apply it to everyone, that anyone can get to heaven and, and you know, stand before God and say, you know, Lord, Lord, I, I, I said this, I did this, I did this. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You didn't do the will of the Father. Okay, well, what's the will of the Father? Is the will of the Father talking about this some kind of level of obedience or is the will of the father to believe in his and the son a lot of different ways of approaching this but it's a scary passage it's a frightening passage and everyone should be concerned with it and try to understand it and look we we don't want to make it say what we want it to say but at the same time if we make it say something about basically calling into question people's you know salvation then we've got to be consistent with that right because if you're going to say, hey, this means you could claim to be saved and you're not saved because you didn't do A, B, C, D, E, well, then you've got to also acknowledge that you're, you're getting ready to turn around and say that no one's going to do these things perfectly. So if no one's going to do it perfectly, how are you ever going to know you're truly saved? So does that not destroy the doctrine of assurance? Like there's so many questions here. So it's a very important section of scripture. So I'm very excited that the listener sent this. I have no idea where this pastor is about to take us. I don't know what he's going to say. He may go a completely different, uh, uh, take a different approach than I do, which is perfectly fine because then we're being confronted with different ideas. But thinking caps on. Are you ready? Thinking caps on. Here we go. Be seated. Now of this passage of scripture, I'd like to focus this morning on simply the last three verses, verses 21, 22, and 23. But I wanted to read the whole passage to emphasize that Christ's prophecy about the last judgment is set in the context of a warning about false prophets. 
That is the context of his prophecy about the last judgment. In verse 21, he begins, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In this passage, these three verses are a frequently misunderstood passage of Scripture. At first glance, Christ seems to be teaching salvation by works. He contrasts those who say, Lord, Lord, but do not work, or apparently do not work, with those who say, or those who he says, do the will of my Father in heaven. That's the superficial reading of this passage. That's what it seems to say. The 1994 Catechism of the uh, Roman Catholic Church cites this very verse to support its view that, and I quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, each one of us should hope with the grace of God to persevere to the end and to obtain the joy of heaven as God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished with the grace of Christ. That's a quote from the Catholic Catechism, 1994. And let me just throw in some context uh, to the Catholic Catechism. As someone who went to a Catholic university to get a degree in Catholic theology, I always want to make sure, understand the way they, the way they view it sometimes is, is kind of confusing, but at least we want to make sure we understand. They believe that, in a sense, initially you're saved by, in a sense, grace alone, faith alone, because of Christ alone. But that initial justification infuses you with a righteousness, infuses you with a righteousness, places a righteousness inside of you, and then you have to cooperate with it to ultimately get that final justification. Now, I'm using maybe some terminology they wouldn't use exactly the same way, but that's kind of the idea. You can, because initially you just get water sprinkled onto you, right? As an, as an infant, as, as, a, as a babe. As, as a baby, and then boom, you know, then there's a regeneration, a regenerative pr- process that begins to take place, and you're infused with a righteousness. Now, the church helps strengthen that righteousness through the sacraments, but you're cooperating with it, right? And then you may be in a state of grace, fall out of the state of grace, got to do penance to get back in a state of grace, and then you're working, and you're you're cooperating, and you're you're trying to utilize all of these means of grace that are given to you through the church. And then hopefully, when you get to the end, then ultimately, hopefully, that final justification, there's been enough righteousness shown in your life that then you can possibly, well, hopefully, you'll get to purgatory. If you don't get to purgatory, well, then you're in real trouble because almost everyone goes to purgatory. Uh, before they can uh, enter into heaven, because even then you're not going to be good enough, so you're going to have to have a purging away and purgatory. But there's a there's this initial idea that yes, you are saved by grace alone, yes, but it that that salvation infuses you with a righteousness, that justification infuses you with a righteousness that you have to cooperate with. So, but I am glad that he brings up uh, the the catechism there because again, a lot of Protestants with without even realizing it, inadvertently creates a system that is much more in line with Roman Catholicism than it is the the Protestant uh, doctrine of justification. And and you just look at them and you're like, you realize you're basically, you basically realize you, you've returned to Catholicism in a way. Even though you say that you haven't, you have. Uh, even though you may not use their language, you're you're supporting the same ideas. And and one of the things that really started changing my views um, when I, uh, in regards to say the, the concept of what some people refer to as lordship salvation, what started causing me to have trouble with some of it was my study of Roman Catholicism. My study of Roman Catholicism was like, wait a minute, we do, we do pretty much the exact same thing here. And so that's when I started having my problem. So I'm glad that he's quoting the Catholic catechism here. All right, so here we go. Uh, even some non-Catholics have the same understanding of this passage. They refer to Christ's message as a message of works here. But if you look at that passage a little bit more closely, as we intend to do this morning, uh, perhaps we'll see something slightly different. It's, it appears to say, it appears to contrast here in this verse, people who say, Lord, Lord, but do not obey or do not do any works, with those who do the will of my Father in heaven. 
And the warning is that Christ offers or appears to be here is that not everyone who says these words, not everyone who acknowledges Christ as Lord uh, will go to heaven, but only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. And that, of course, seems to contradict uh, other passages of Scripture. And then I would just throw in right there in that passage, the real question for any good Bible student is this. Let me read it to you again. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is he referring to? Do the will of my Father in heaven. What is the Father's will? Is the Father's will complete obedience? Well, if you're going to start putting this in, in the area of obeying, well, God's, God's command is be holy as he is holy. All right, if that's the will of the Father is to be as holy as he is holy, you're never going to obey that. You're never going to fulfill that. So is it possible that the will there is referring that he wills something specific here in this context? And could it be that he wills that we follow his son, we listen to his son, we believe in his son? Could that be the possible answer there? Because if you say, no, only those who do the will of the Father get into heaven, and that refers to obedience, well, then what is the will of the Father when it comes to obedience? It would be perfect obedience. Well, that's, we're never going to meet that. And at that point, what is even the point of Jesus coming and what's the point of his imputed righteousness? But if the will there is referring to listening to his son, following his son, believing in his son, then there's a possible answer to that. And again, I, you, I would challenge you to start working on that and see what you, you can come up with on your own. We'll see what direction he goes here. In which simple belief, simple faith is offered as the way of salvation. Uh, he mentions doing in verse 21 here. If you contrast that with Acts 16.31, for example, where the statement is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Or you contrast it with Romans chapter 3, verse 28. A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And Romans 4, 5, uh, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So there seems to be perhaps a difficulty in understanding what Christ is saying in verse 21, but I trust it won't last long. But we are faced with the immediate question here, is Christ teaching legalism? And I'm using legalism in the strict sense. Is he teaching salvation by obedience to law or salvation by works? Is that what he's teaching? If so, then we have a problem with other passages of Scripture which teach that salvation is through faith alone. Now, I intend to answer this question, uh, but I'm going to save it for the end of my discussion because we need to look at the last of this prophecy uh, to understand the first part of it. Let's go on then to the next verse. And the next verse, verse 22, is quite surprising in a couple of ways. If you look back at verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And one might draw the inference from that that, well, there will be a few who will not make it into heaven, even though they acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. But notice how Christ begins in verse 22. It's not a few. It's many. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? It's many folks. The not everyone of verse 21 does not mean a few. It means many folks. Some of those who say, Lord, Lord, in the day of judgment will enter heaven, but Christ says many will not even though they acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. Now, this is a day of judgment that we all will face. This is a prophecy. There's no possibility that this will not happen. And we all will be called to account before God for every thought, word, and deed that we have done in the body. 
This is not a parable. This is not an imaginary event. This is a prophecy. And when we are called to account, we will have to answer for ourselves. There will be no lawyers there to help us. There will be no pastor. There will be no priest. There will be no parent. There will be no teacher. There will be no friends. We will be answering for ourselves. We will be held individually responsible. Notice that these people, in verse 22, answer for themselves. Many will say to me in that day, they do not send their lawyers, they do not send their priests, they do not send their pastors or their elders. They say, and they speak to Christ directly themselves, and they will appeal to Christ. Notice the appeal. They preface it, Lord, 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 Lord. This will happen. Christ is not exaggerating. This is not, again, imaginary. This is exactly what will happen in the day of judgment. They will stand before Christ and they will address him as Lord. We're told in the scripture that at the end of time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it will. But that doesn't mean that Every tongue and every knee will be saved. We're told here that these people will acknowledge him as Lord and they will be damned. They will not be saved. They will not enter heaven. Despite the fact that they acknowledge him as Lord. Now notice what they say to the Lord. Notice what they say. Notice what they will say. You can speak in the past because it is so certain that this will happen. We can treat it as a past event. But notice what they will say. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, there are several things we ought to notice about that question. First, these are not pew warmers. These are not folks who come on Sunday morning and do nothing the rest of the week. These are folks who have prophesied, they have preached, they have taught, they have cast out demons, and they have worked wonders. These are not pew warmers. These are not empty professors, as you might have been led to believe by verse 21. These are not folks who say something and do nothing. These are folks who do the greatest works among men. They have preached. They have prophesied. They have cast out demons. They have worked wonders. These are the greatest works among men that these folks have done. And these folks are not exaggerating either. This is the last judgment. They're not standing there lying. And there's no suggestion that they are. Christ does not answer them and say, well, you didn't do any of those things. He does not correct them. This is a report of what they have done. This is a report of what they have done. So their profession is not a profession without works. They have been extremely active, and they have done what is, in fact, the greatest works done among men. Now we can further learn from their question here that uh, they were churchgoers. Notice that they add the phrase after all of these works that they have done, we have done this in your name. These are not pagans. These are not people who are ignorant of the name of Jesus Christ. They have done these works in the name of Jesus Christ. They have preached, they have prophesied, they have worked wonders and cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. These are not folks in Africa who never heard the name. These are not folks in Greece before the time of Christ who never heard the name. 
These are not people who were uninformed of Christ. These were folks who did all these deeds uh, in the name of Christ. And these deeds are extraordinary. These deeds are extraordinary. If you think about it, none of us has done anything or will do anything even as remotely as impressive as these people. None of us has done anything or will do anything as spectacular as these people. These people that Christ says will not be allowed to enter heaven. Now, if He does a very good job there of building that up. Look, if we sit here in church, hear this preached, and go, well, those people weren't saved. Well, look at all the things they did. Look at all the things they did. Have you done anything close to that? Have you done anything remotely within, you know, a hundred miles of that? And if you haven't, but you're confident that you're going in, but they're not, how did, why do you not stop and at least give pause and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the people who do all of those things aren't saved, then how do I ever hope to be saved? Because I don't have any of the works like that. My, my works don't even come close to comparing to all the things that they've done. Right? And, and, and I, I, whenever we talk about justification and judgment and judgment according to works, I constantly bring that up that these are people who have done, not, not only have they have a profession, Lord, Lord, they have done works. So they have the profession, they have works, yet they're not saved. So then what do you need? Profession is not enough. Works are not enough. What do you need in order to be saved? Th this raises a lots of very important questions. And everyone should be willing to ask these questions and struggle with it. All right. That, that's what we should do. All right. Let, let's I'm, I'm letting him I'm going to try to let him go as much as I can without interrupting because uh, he's he's doing this in a really like he's kind of presenting the problem and building and building until whenever he gives the answer, which is kind of a, a pretty clever way of doing this. If that's the case, if that's the case, if their works far outshine ours, what hope is there for us? What hope is there for us? If Christ will send these people to hell, what hope is there? For us, if he will turn them away from heaven at the last judgment and turn them into everlasting punishment reserved for the devil and his ministers, what hope is there for us? And the Christian answer is, if we rely on our own works, we have no hope. The Christian answer is, if we rely on our own works, we have no hope. At the last judgment, the pleas, the defense of these church leaders, these are active folks. These are not people who come and are not active in the churches. These are active folks. At the last judgment, their pleas will be their works. That is what they are saying. Look at what we have done. Look at what we have done. And Jesus says, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. If these folks are sent to hell then certainly our works cannot be the basis for our entering into heaven. What do these folks not say in their defense? What do they not say at the last judgment in their own defense? What do they not utter a syllable about? They do not mention the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. They say, haven't we prophesied? Haven't we worked wonders? Haven't we cast out demons? They do not mention the righteousness of Christ. They do not mention the substitutionary atonement of Christ. 
They do not mention the satisfaction of the Father's justice on their behalf by Christ. They do not mention the propitiation of the wrath of the Father by Christ. They do not mention Christ as Savior. And because they do not mention Christ as Savior, they are not saved. They are not saved any more than the demons who believe in God. James warns us. says the demons believe in God. And they're demons. That's not enough. These folks obviously believe on believe something about God. They obviously believe something about Christ. But they do not believe that Christ is their Savior. There's even a demon reported in the first chapter of Mark, verses 23 and 24, who recognizes exactly who Jesus is. He says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And he's a demon and he will go to hell. He does not acknowledge the gospel. And these folks at the last judgment do not breathe one word about the gospel. One of the things we ought to learn from this warning that Christ gives us here, where he gives us this prophecy for our learning and for a warning, is that if we rely on anything, on anything we do, we're lost. We're lost. If these folks who do the greatest works done among men are lost, then surely we're lost. If we appear before Christ at the last judgment and say, well, I attended church for 50 years, we're lost. I served as a deacon or I served as an elder or I served as a pastor, we're lost. If we say, well, I tithe 50% of my income, we're lost. We're lost. If we say, well, I taught in a Christian school or a Christian college all my life, we're lost. We're damned. We say, I wrote books, we're lost. If we say, I held evangelistic crusades attended by millions, we're lost. We're lost. That's exactly what these men will say. I prophesied in your name. I preached in your name. If we say I raised money for the church, if we say I built hospitals and schools, we're lost. We're absolutely lost. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the prophet says, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. All, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. He does not say, all our unrighteousnesses are filthy rags. He says, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. At the last judgment, uh, many people... Christ says these churchgoers, these church leaders, will argue with Jesus that they deserve heaven. They will argue that they deserve heaven because of what they have done. That is their defense. We deserve heaven because of what we have done. They do not confess themselves to be sinners. They believe they are righteous men. Their prayer is not, Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. But, Jesus, I did many good works in your name. And you have to reward me with heaven. That's the argument these folks present. They do not believe in the grace of God. They do not believe in the sinfulness of themselves. Whatever they do believe, whatever message they preached, it wasn't the substitutionary atonement of Christ and the imputation of the righteousness of Christ through faith alone to believers. That was the message they did not preach. That's the message they don't believe. That's the message they don't mention at the last judgment. But the warning that Christ gives here is not just about the futility of works, our works. 
as a basis for entering heaven. It is more than that and more profound than that. It's a basis or it's a warning about believing some things about God and Jesus, but not the gospel. Many people believe some things about God. And many people believe some things about Jesus. Things which may, in fact, happen to be true. I mentioned the demon in Mark 1 who addresses Jesus as the Holy One of God. And he is the Holy One of God. That's true. But it's not saving. Jesus here tells us that folks, many folks, can believe in God and be lost. He's talking here about people in the Christian churches. They have done these things in the name of Christ. <clears throat> what they don't mention is the summary of the gospel that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. If you'd like to turn there and follow along, I'll read that to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. These many church leaders, these many churchgoers at the Last Judgment will not breathe a word of this. They will not say, Christ died for my sins. They will say, I have preached... I have worked miracles. I have cast out demons. They will not profess the gospel. Turn to Romans 3, if you would, please. Beginning at verse 20. Romans 3. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Turn over to Romans 5 and look at verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Many will be made righteous. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel that these lost souls at the last judgment have no belief in. They have no belief in. Look at the next verse, verse 23. <clears throat> and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
All right, I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to throw out a possible alternative interpretation here, okay? Just stay with me. I know you may disagree with me here, but just stay with me. All right, if we go through this whole passage, all right? We, okay, we start back in 13, enter in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. All right, so there's this warning about make sure you go through the straight gate uh, versus the wide gate. All right, very, I think that's very clear that the application there seems to be broad, referring to everyone, right? It's referring to everyone, hey, enter the straight gate. But then in the very, in verse 15, it's like he goes from kind of a broader application to a very narrowed focus here. Because in verse 15, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know, please note, them by their fruits do men gather grapes and thorns uh, or figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree that bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth uh, evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil uh, fruit, but neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is shewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. The them is definitely back to the false prophets. And then he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? To me, verse 22, this would be to me describing false prophets. The false prophets would be the ones walking around prophesying in his name. The false prophets would be the one walking around tra- casting out devils. The false prophets would be the one going around supposedly doing wonderful works. To me, this is a reference to the judgment of false prophets. And then verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, there's the them again that I think goes back to the false prophets. I never knew you depart from me, ye that work, or at work uh, the, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, uh, uh, and I'll stop right there. I think that the whole passage is referring to the false prophets. This is the false prophets. There's going to be a lot of people walking around preaching in the name of Jesus, supposedly doing miracles. They're going to do all of these things and they're going to think that they're saved, but they're not saved. They were false prophets. Why are they, what makes them false prophets? Well, you could talk about the, the, the uh, false doctrine that they teach. And you could argue that, the, well, I think there's two ways. I mean, I don't even think there's an argument here. To be a false prophet would require two things. Number one, false doctrine. And number two, not trusting in Christ alone for salvation. So I think this is the application here is towards the false prophets. You can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I just think the context there, he, he keeps using them, them. And that goes back to the false prophets. The false prophets are going to stand before God in the last day claiming, hey, aren't we're, we did all of these things. They say, depart from me. I never knew you. You've been false prophets. You taught false doctrine and you did not believe the right things. Um, you, and when I say believe the right things, believe the right things in, regard, in order of, of salvation. In other words, you did not trust in Christ alone. You didn't trust in his finished righteousness. You didn't trust in his propitiation. You trust in yourselves. I, I think that that may be, I know he, he, he definitely talked about the false prophets, but he seems to, uh, he seems to reference verse 21 and 22 and 23 as a broader application referring to everyone. But I think that the context, the immediate context is he's referring to the false prophets and that it just makes sense that the false prophets would be the one, one saying, hey, we prophesied, we cast out demons. That would be the things that a false prophet would say. That, 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 it just seems that that language definitely makes me think of false prophets. So I, I, I'm going to kind of, I, I kind of stick with that interpretation there first and foremost. I, I think at least, at least put it this way. I think my perspective should at least be considered. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Just uh, as an incidental remark and aside here, 
God himself establishes legal procedure in the scriptures. It's established at the last judgment. When we talk about due process, we get our conception of due process from the scriptures. We're sinners. But look at what God does with these folks. Look what Jesus does with these folks. He allows them to offer their defense. He allows them to present their argument. He does not speak until after they have offered their defense and their argument. And then he pronounces judgment. We're all sinners deserving the immediate punishment for our sins. But he forbears and he treats us as creatures, rational creatures made in his image. They speak and he responds and notice his declaration to them. I will declare to them, this will happen. This is not a parable. This is not imaginary. This is a future event. I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. These folks who had been very active in their churches, leading their churches, says, I never knew you. He's not speaking to folks who are ignorant of the name of Jesus Christ. He is speaking to people who are in the churches. He says, I never knew you. That ought to remind us of Romans 8:29. Whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. One theologian has called that the golden chain of salvation. Romans 8:29. And Christ here says that I never knew you. The process never began. Because I never knew you. I never loved you. I never called you. I never justified you. And I'm not going to glorify you. I never knew you. And notice the never. He doesn't say, well, I once knew you. But you backslid and lost your salvation. He says, I never knew you. Never. They had not been saved at one time and lost at the end of their lives. That's an impossibility. He says, at no time did he know them. At no time. I never knew you. Notice also from his statement that Jesus decides who enters heaven. I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you who practice lawlessness. Hell is separation from Christ. And he commands them to go. He commands these very active church folk to depart from him. He describes them here in this statement as you who practice lawlessness. You who practice lawlessness. Now, if we had seen these people on earth, we might be impressed with their works. We might be impressed with their works. They cast out demons. They perform wonders. They preached and prophesied. We might be impressed with their works. But Jesus refers to their works as lawlessness. He refers to their works as lawlessness. Why does he do that? Why does he call these spectacular works lawlessness? Because they are seeking to establish their own righteousness by their own works, and that is lawlessness. Legalism is lawlessness. Legalism is lawlessness. The law, as we read earlier, is given for the knowledge of sin. It is not given for the justification of the believer. 
The law is given for the knowledge of sin. And that is the legal use of the law. To try to use the law in a way of justifying oneself is an illegal use of the law. This is what the Galatian teachers were trying to do. And they're cursed by Paul. The law is good when legally used. But when it is misused as the basis for our justification, it is lawlessness. Legalism is lawlessness. And he condemns these people who are trying to establish their own righteousness by their own works as lawless. Our obedience to the law is never the basis of justification. Never. It wasn't in the Old Testament, and it's not in the New Testament. The Old Testament saints are saved the same way the New Testament saints are saved, by belief alone. By belief alone. But there's still that nagging question. What does verse 21 mean? Christ had said back in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What does the phrase, doing the Father's will, mean if it doesn't mean works? I promised earlier I would try to answer this question, and now I'll try. What does this phrase mean if it doesn't mean works? It certainly appears to be works, he who does the will, rather than he who says. Well, Christ used the phrase and similar phrases as a synonym for belief. Look at John 6.40. Look at John 6.40. This is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. That's the will of the Father. Now stop right there. That is so good uh, right there. And I think we, we everyone needs to just stop and write down John 640 and memorize it. All right. And this is the will of him that sent me that everyone would see at the sun and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up the last day. The will of the father is that we believe on the son. If we do not believe and trust in the son, then we're not doing the will of the father. Matthew 6, 40, write that down. In fact, I would go back to Matthew 7 and write in somewhere in your Bible, Matthew or John 6, 40, back there in Matthew 7. I would write there somewhere in next to that verse because that's a cross-reference you need to remember. What is the will of the Father? If you're going to do the will of the Father, you believe in the Son whom he sent. John chapter 6, verse 40, let me read it to you again. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. All right, that's a very, very powerful verse, very significant in interpreting Matthew 7 correctly. All right, let's see if he offers any other cross-references. John 6, 28 and 29. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So there you are. If you want to know what works you need to do in order to be saved, if you want to know what works that could be judged, we, when we say we're judged according to our works, we're judged according to the work of belief. That's the work of belief. Now, we can only do that work as obviously God grants us the faith and the repentance. We could get into a, a whole discussion about that, but the point is that it speaks of the will of the Father is believing in the Son and that the work of the of the work that we are to do is believing in the Son. Both concepts go back to believing and trusting in the Son. I think that's very very important to understand. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. At another point when Jesus' mother and brothers were desiring to see him, he ignores them. 
Matthew 12:50 says, "Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother." He's not suggesting that they didn't do the Father's will and that they did no works, but whoever believes in him is my mother and my brother and my sister. Now, if we understand Christ's warning here in these three verses about the last judgment, we can better understand why this is set in the context of false prophets. Why we can better understand verses 13 through 20 there, the warning about the false prophets. These folks who will appear before Christ, the last judgment, are the false prophets. They are the folks who will appear before Christ and said, we've preached in your name. We've prophesied in your name. We've done wonders. We've done miracles. We've cast out demons. And he sends them to hell. Okay, so he does seem to return back to the false prophets, saying that the people that are being spoken here is the false prophets, which I think is absolutely the case. This is referring to false prophets. What do we learn about these false prophets? Is that they 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 claim uh, to to some allegiance, some understanding of Christ as Lord. They do good works, but clearly they're false prophets. So they're teaching something that is false, and clearly they're not trusting in Christ and him alone for salvation. They are trusting in some kind of their own works by keeping the law, which makes them, that's a form of lawlessness because you're not using the law correctly, right? I, I, I think that that makes I think that makes sense, and I think you have to place the false prophets there. Uh, it, it sounded like earlier he was applying that in a more broad, in a, in a broad way, applying to everyone. I think the, the main focus here is this is the judgment of the false prophets. We tend to misread what fruit is when we read the Bible. We think fruit is works. It can be. I'm not ruling it out. Scripture doesn't rule it out. But it is primarily doctrine. It is primarily doctrine. These people who go to hell had plenty of works. And if we see them on earth, we will be very impressed by them. But it's their doctrine, their disbelief of the gospel, their belief in their own righteousness that is the bad fruit. It's their doctrine, their belief in their own righteousness, their disbelief in the gospel that sends them to hell. Whatever they preached, and they did preach, they did not preach the righteousness of Christ imputed to believers through faith alone. They did not preach the righteousness of Christ imputed to believers through faith alone. They preached things in Christ's name, but not the gospel. But not the gospel. I'd like to leave you with some questions. And I'll emphasize it again. What Christ is speaking about here is absolutely certain. There will be a judgment. We will all appear in person, individually. We will all be judged. What will be your defense? What will be your plea? Will it be your works? The works you have done in the name of Christ? Will it be your service? Will it be your accomplishments? Or will it be the work of Christ alone? Anyone, Christ says, who relies on his own works or relies on a combination of his works and Christ's works will not enter heaven. Will not enter heaven. Depart from me. Anyone who thinks he deserves heaven will not enter heaven. Anyone who does not consider himself a sinner will not enter heaven. Miracles, prophecies, casting out demons will not help. Judas Iscariot did all three. And he was lost. The son of perdition. Friends, our only hope in life and death 
is Jesus Christ and him crucified. His righteousness and his righteousness alone. Let's pray. Wow, that was some good stuff. Really trying to handle that text. Uh, what I what I think is the more uh, correct way of handling that text. Uh, I'm not going to say much more than that. I think I think it's right there. Now, now some people may have some questions and thoughts, and they feel free to email me at newsif at yahoo.com, and then we may come back in another episode and look at everyone's email questions. But what we will also do is we're going to take, we'll find a sermon from a completely different approach. Um, I think we'll probably try to find a MacArthur sermon on this section and see how he handles it to just offer the contrast. When the church in Council Bluffs, Iowa gets to that section, we'll see how they handle it. And we'll come back to this idea because I think... um, I think there's a, there, there's a lot of different ways of approaching this, and we need to consider them all. Have have our perspectives challenged? Um, and but I think I think I think there he did a lot right there that I think was very very important. And that perspective that was just offered, you need to really consider because I think it goes against the way that a lot of evangelicals handle that. A lot of the way a lot of Christians handle that, and I think we need to hear that perspective. So to the listener who emailed that to me, thank you. That was good stuff. That was an enjoyable one hour and 10 minutes. Um, that was that, 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 that was really good. That pastor is much calmer than I am, much more deliberate than I am, much more well-spoken than I am. The only thing I, I, was, I was like, come on, you put a little, get a little, uh, uh, you know, emotion into it. Okay, get a little bit more excited. Maybe I'm too excited when I teach and preach. Maybe I'm too, you know, over the top, but uh, but it was still very good stuff. And and, and but you know what, a pastor, uh, every every pastor has to, I think, has to be somewhat honest with our personalities. If your personality is more calm that way, then I think you should preach that way. And if your personality is more, let's just say, loud, like mine tends to be, then by all means you have to be that way. I think there, your your personality has to be there, or you start trying to pretend to be something you're not, and then your preaching becomes performance instead of preaching. So. Um, yeah, I was kind of like, okay, can, can emphasize, okay, come on, get, but it was just very straightforward, but hey, it was still good stuff, still wonderful, and uh, all right, someone said, uh, someone said, yes, thank, uh, thank you, listener, yeah, thank, uh, Will just said uh, to thank the listener, yes, the listener, thank you very much, I think everyone's going to benefit from that greatly, I really do, I, I think that was, I think it was well said, well spoken, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what the responses are to it. And then, like I said, we'll come back uh, probably the next time we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll pull out a MacArthur sermon to just show you a completely radically different approach. What I may find, I may pull up some, if I can get some of the lectures from Catholic University, I may pull up some Catholic uh, lectures on this section just to see how Catholicism handles it. Um, because I just, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing, the series on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not worried about like when we stop, we're just going to keep looking at different things related to the text and uh, just there's so many different approaches to every one of the verses in the Sermon on the Mount that really this could be a series that will never end <laughs> because there's there, like for every verse in the Sermon on the Mount there's like there's 300 different approaches to it so maybe would this just be the never-ending series on the Sermon on the Mount but I think people will always benefit every time they tune in all right thanks for Will for listening to us live anyone else who was listening to us live thank you I'm going to stop for a second and figure out what I'm going to do next, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Tomorrow at Victory Baptist Church, uh, we'll probably be back uh, to the Niagara Creed for Sunday school, and then we're still trying to figure out some things in Romans 8 and what I think is a very important section. Um, I I think it's really, really interesting, so I think that's where it will be. And then I think Sunday night, if everything works— Yes, the cross reference to John 6 was very useful. Absolutely. Yeah, that was that was good stuff right there. And then uh Sunday night, I think what we're going to do, I, th- I think I'm going to go ahead. I've already kind of opened this can of worms, but I'm going to go ahead and just pour <laughs> pour it out on the floor. I think we're going to go to 1 John Sunday night. We'll do an overview of the book and then we're going to work at that very controversial section in 1 John chapter 3. I think that's what we're going to do. Um I ugh, I, I kind of got there the other day. But I think uh, we're going to dig into that. Uh, So I think that's the plan. So 
that's that'll be what's going on tomorrow. And then I don't know. Uh, I never know from Sunday to Sunday w- how things are going to work when I can get here and how much I, live broadcasting I can do. If everything works out, I'll be here multiple hours tomorrow um, doing some live broadcasting, most likely in the afternoon, not in the morning. But who knows how that works? If I can get here in the morning and do a couple of hours, I will do that as well. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Will, for participating. Everyone have a great day, and I should be back on the air here shortly. God bless.